Right, very good evening to you. Uh, welcome to the LSE, um, students, alumni, others. You're all welcome this evening. Uh, I'm Tony Travers uh, from uh, British Government at LSE, the Government Department. I'm chairing this evening's event. And the event is very much about uh, the new book that's been written by Charles Moore on uh, Mrs. Thatcher, on Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the, uh, it's a it's an authorised biography, and uh, we'll hear a lot more about this in a moment from Charles Moore, who is a former editor of the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, and the Spectator. He still writes, indeed, for the Telegraph, the, Sunday, the Daily Telegraph, and the Spectator. Uh, Charles Moore has been an enemy of authorita authoritarian laws and authoritarian government actions, willing to side with unlikely allies where he thought it was right to do so, and for example, has supported the legalization of drugs. He was once quoted glowingly in The Observer, can you believe, as stating that English freedom should be justified along the following lines. I quote, I just want to pursue my life and I want you to be able to do the same. It's commonsensical rather than staring eyed. He's been a stern critic, critic of the BBC, uh, which he believes shows bias towards <coughs> the left and against Thatcherism. But Moore is no easily categorised right-winger. In 2011, he wrote in the Daily Telegraph, and I quote again, is the left right after all? You see, one of the great arguments of, left, of the left is that what the right calls the free market is actually a setup. A ri the rich run a global system that allows them to accumulate capital and to pay the lowest possible price for labour. The freedom that results applies only to them. The many simply have to work harder in conditions that grow ever more insecure to enrich the few. Democratic politics, which purports to enrich the many, is actually in the pockets of those bankers, media barons, I promise you this is Charles Moore, uh, <laughs> and other moguls who, write, who run and own everything." Unquote. He then went on to argue that the left may indeed have been accurate in this analysis. Though I should add, at the end of the article, he added, and again I quote, one must always pray that conservatism will be saved, as has so often been the case in the past, by the stupidity of the left. <laughs> now these words, among many millions of others, were written by tonight's speaker, the authorised biographer, as I said a moment ago, of Margaret Thatcher. It's an authorised biography which has had access to all the Thatcher papers, and has required an enormous amount of effort, which I think has been going on now for 10 years. I and mean, you started a, a lot more in a way. Yeah. More in a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, volume one, Not For Turning, was published immediately after uh, her funeral last week. And A.N. Wilson, in a glowing review, which you can read in the Evening Standard tonight, says, and I quote, it is very easy to see why a substantial minority of people in Britain really hated Mrs. Thatcher what they abominate are often those very qualities that Moore most loves. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher, as I'm pretty sure she will always be known, was undoubtedly a personality who polarised opinion, though I suspect she rather enjoyed, rather enjoyed doing so. And I see from Charles Moore's book that she met the man who was to make the introduction that started her political career in my hometown in North Wales of Llandidno. There are very many more unusual details and much wider analysis in the biography that we're going to hear about tonight, which spans Margaret Thatcher's life to 1983. Worth remembering that when we come to questions at the end. The hashtag you can see here is LSE Thatcher, and Charles will speak for perhaps half an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and a book signing on the stage afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Moore. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tony, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be here because I feel that I come among you unmuzzled. You are actually the first. I've done a lot of television and newspaper interviews and radio interviews, in fact, incessantly um, in the last few days. But this is the first time I've actually been able to give a talk of any length since the book was published. And um, it is a wonderful feeling for me because there's been, for so long, this enormous amount of stuff that I've known that I haven't been allowed to say anything about to anybody. Uh, and I've also had to keep it secret, and I'll, um, I'll tell you a bit about uh, some, one or two of the problems that came up with that later on. W what I'm going to give is a sort of free-flowing talk about the book, um, 
and any questions whatever that arise. The only point I would make, though of course I'm delighted to answer questions about uh, the whole of Mrs. Thatcher's career, is that it does end, in fact, in 1982, actually, not 1983, sorry, sorry. with the Falklands victory. And so I can't give, I can't reveal new stuff that I've learnt in any detail from the later period, and there will be some things that I don't yet know really enough about to give a very authoritative... Um, but of course, I'm happy to do the, the whole spread. Here we are, we're from birth until um, Falkton's victory. Um, in 1997, I was just peacefully editing the Daily Telegraph and um, thinking about nothing else, and I got a call from Julian Seymour, who uh, was director of Lady Thatcher's office and is indeed today, has returned to that job actually in more recent years. And we had lunch, and he said, would you like to write her authorised biography? And I had no idea at all that this was in the offing. And I wasn't asked to apply to any, for anything, and I hadn't thought of applying. It was simply completely news to me. And um, what had happened, I think, I don't know the full story, but you will remember that, um, well, all prime ministers have masses and masses of papers which they take away, they're entitled to take what's called their personal papers away with them when they leave government. There are a lot of papers they have to leave behind. And so there are two enormous sources of paper. One is those personal papers, and the other is all the government paper that stays in the government machine and is ultimately released under the 30-year rule. Mrs. Thatcher, having been Prime Minister um, for 11 and a half years and not being known as an idle woman, had um, accumulated an unbelievable quantity of of paper. And the question was, of course, what should she do with it? She was offered an enormous sum by an American university to uh, sell it to them, and she refused, and she uh, wanted to give it to the nation. I think technically it's on permanent loan uh, to the nation. And where would she put it? Um, some of you will remember that though she was an Oxford undergraduate, Oxford very rudely uh, refused her an honorary degree when she was prime minister. So Naturally, she gave it to Cambridge, and, um, uh, it's, at, and it's in uh, Churchill, Churchill College, Cambridge, which, in my opinion, is the best uh, political archive in the country. I can't speak too highly of, of how they uh, catalogue and look after and understand this material. At the time that she did this, the question, uh, some of her advisors said to her, well, look, we think, Lady T, that someone is going to write your biography. Well, I think that was, wasn't, didn't have to be too shrewd to realise that. So why um, don't you, rather than just leaving it to the fates, why don't you um, uh, uh, approach someone who you, you feel you can trust uh, and um, uh, say to them, give them complete access so that they can then get on with it. Um, and, and complete access uh, means just that. She then very kindly uh, chose me, and I don't know why, um, actually, and she never said, and um, uh, nobody ever told me. But. Um, I, once I had this offer, of course, in some ways I didn't want to do it because it's such an enormous undertaking, absolutely crippling, enormous undertaking. But it was a great honour to be asked and, and of course, a, a subject of enormous fascination. I don't really much enjoy most political biography, to be honest, as a reader. I often find that the interest of the subject flags compared with the enormous amount of detail you have to get through. But I think this is totally untrue of Margaret Thatcher, both because of her personality, because of the extraordinary number of things she found herself doing, and because she was, the sim very simple but so important point, the first and only woman. And um, all that coming together does make it, I find, an absolutely gripping story. So sometimes I've been very intimidated by the quantity, but I've been constantly excited by the quality of the material. And I've never thought, why the hell am I doing this? I've, I've often thought, can, can I do it? But I haven't thought, I want, I want to get out of this. So um, uh, I accepted um, this, uh, this. And then the terms were these, that um, I was allowed to see all her papers. She would hold uh, nothing back. I, I was also given access to herself for interview and all her family, including Dennis. Um, and she also invited everybody who'd ever worked with her in any way to cooperate with me, and that's very important because a lot of her closest people had always refused to talk. Um, and of course, civil servants have a general rule that they can't uh, speak about their work unless they're given permission. So a general permission was given to all existing and former civil servants to, to speak to me. And following on from the authorization of the, the, her papers for my uh, study, 
the cabinet secretary gave authorization that I should be uh, excused from the 30-year rule that protects papers under a system by which I'm positively vetted in case I'm a Chinese spy or something. And, um, and I then was allowed to quote, uh, sorry, I was allowed to look at everything. Um, I'm not automatically permitted to quote everything I've seen, but when I, the way it worked is that when I wrote the manuscript, I had to submit it to the relevant government departments, not for any comment on any, um, you know, any judgment I would make, which obviously they wouldn't be allowed to do, but to say, would I be allowed to actually to quote those words? And in 99% of cases, I was allowed to. The sort of thing you may be interested in, that they, tend, they like to take out, tend to be one or two things about from the palace. The palace is very careful indeed. For example, you can't quote directly from a letter from the sovereign. Uh, would be one, one thing. And the other thing is um, uh, intelligence. Uh, I'm pretty free to write about it. In fact, very free to write about intelligence in most respects. But one thing they don't like is operational detail and sometimes names and c sometimes code names. So there are one or two code names in the book. But really, apart from that, um, pretty well nothing got excised. So I was happy about that. So uh, I, the, Mrs. Thatcher wasn't paying me. Her stipulation was that um, uh, I, she would not be allowed to read the book and it should not appear in her lifetime, and hence this fact that it's appeared now, so shortly after her death, volume, volume one. And the reason for that was that she didn't want people to say that she'd tried to control uh, what I wrote, because obviously that would vitiate its, uh, its, its value. Um, and I think also she didn't want it to appear in her lifetime because uh, then she might be dragged into controversies in old age which she wouldn't be ready to, to deal with. And I can't tell you how wonderful that is for me that she said that. And what's even more wonderful and, and, and frankly very surprising is that she didn't try to control it. I could not believe it. I thought, here's this woman who you know, is not known for not bossing people around. And, um, and she literally never said to me... Uh, what are you going to say? Or don't say that. Or you must say this. Or, nor did she do that thing which I know a lot of people with authorised biographies do, which is they try to withdraw permission in the middle. They say, I don't like you anymore. Um, uh, don't, you do, you're asking me funny questions. Um, you know, and the, suddenly your whole the biographer's life is ruined. Um, and the terrible tensions can result. And she really was very, very good about that. And I, I ask myself why... And I think it's something to do with her, um, her particular character, because, and also I think with her sex, uh, because a typical male, I've talked to people who've written the biography of male politicians, and a typical male thing about your biography is that you, you want to congratulate yourself on your little successes. And you're particularly, um, particularly if you're quite literary minded yourself, like Harold Macmillan, for example, who was a good writer and a publisher you want to tell these funny little stories about how clever you were in particular situations, and you, you want it to be told in just this particular way. And of course, Margaret Thatcher had an enormous ego, and in some ways she had a very high opinion of herself about sort of saving the world sort of opinion, but she didn't, she wasn't interested, she didn't have that sort of vanity, so she didn't want the story told in this particular sort of clubby male way, and she didn't care how the story was told. And um, I think what she thought is, I'm... You know, I've done it. I've done all these things. Um, somebody else is going to write about it. That's their affair. And it's, it's such a release for me. Uh, so it made it so easy. And also, I think, in a funny way, she wasn't interested because um, she didn't like uh, looking back and she didn't like self-examination. And she had, which is, I think, something quite common in that era, and particularly in women of that era, is a great dislike of anything that she might consider in any way private. Um, and so she would instinctively not want to talk about lots of things or think about them. And um, this could be, this was basically a wonderful advantage for me, but it did have some disadvantages. And in the late 90s, I started the, the work um, by interview. I wasn't, while I was editing the Daily Telegraph, I was not in a position to get on with the serious job of going through all the documents. But I did think, particularly as I knew already, the public didn't know this at the time, but Lady Thatcher very slightly started her mental decline in 1997. And it became much worse in the 21st century. And it, so, so it was in those 
sort of three years from 97 when I got the offer that I, um, and I sold it, the idea to Penguin the following year through my agent, that uh, I got on with the interviews with her and Dennis and, and several other people. And she's a very strange person to interview from a historical point of view because um, what ha she, her idea of an interview, so instinctive after so long, is that this is political combat, that she's on television and it's got to be a battle. You know, the famous interviews of the day, like Robin Day or someone like that, Brian Walden. Um, she would, um, the sort of equivalent of, of Paxman today, uh, she would think she's sort of on stage and she's got to... So I would, I would try to ask simple factual questions. You're just simply trying to ascertain information in order to build up your picture. And she would suddenly um, decide to argue with this and really, and really get out of the subject. So let's say I would say... Um, I remember a picture example, actually... I, said, I was asking a question about her mother, a subject which she was always a little touchy about. And, um, and she said um, she was a sempstress and she did wonderful voluntary work. And that's the thing about the women of Britain. They do marvellous voluntary work, <laughs> not like French women. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, off she was, away from the... And, um, and, and another time, I said, I can't remember what the question was about, actually. And she suddenly said, you only say that because you're a socialist. And, um, and, you know, that was the sort of combat. And I just had to wait and let the, the, the water flow, the wave crash over me and try and come out the other side. And this was a problem, much more informal interview than it was in conversation. So I tried to balance formal interview, where obviously you can get more information, but you had this problem of combat, with chat. So we would quite often have lunch or a cup of tea or something like that, or I might just meet her at somebody else's party or dinner, and I would ask her things, and then it was much easier to elicit less... You'd have less of a, a battle. Um, I uh, did all this, uh, and this was only very much the beginning, and then I decided in um, the summer of 2003, uh, Dennis died, and um, I went to the funeral, and I noticed... Not only was she obviously deeply, deeply upset, but she was profoundly confused and disoriented. And, um, and that went on. And I noticed that there was a really sharp deterioration in what already had been a declining uh, mind. And I thought, gosh, I really must uh, get on with this work and do it properly. And so I decided to leave. I'd had a secret plan to leave the Daily Telegraph editorship the following year, and I brought it forward by six months uh, to get on with it. And then, so off I went, really, to get stuck into the work. And one thing I'd done um, while I was still editing was I went to see um, Margaret's sister, Muriel. She, only, she had no brothers and one sister who was four years older. And Muriel was um, a, a much more formidable character than Margaret. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And uh, more right wing, and um, <laughs> and, uh, and um, uh, unlike Margaret, had no interest in the public stage, whatever. She was married to um, a, 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 a Scottish a farmer of Scottish origin, quite a big farmer in Essex, and um, she lived a quiet life there, um, helping on the farm, bringing up her children. But she had this tremendous sort of strength of character, and uh, I talked to her, and it's very very interesting because she was really the only absolutely intimate witness from it. Well, there were a couple of other friends, actually, who are still alive, uh, girlfriends of Margaret in her youth, but essentially the great witness of the early years is Muriel. And uh, I talked to her. She'd had a stroke even when I first met her, but her mind was perfect, except for that strange thing that often happens after a stroke where you muddle up a name. So whenever she referred to Margaret, she used to call, called her Jane because that was her daughter's name. But once I'd realised that what's, that's what she meant, I, it wasn't difficult. And... She, she produced, um, out of attics, this treasure trove of letters from Margaret to her, written from um, the late 1930s until the early 1960s, which essentially tell you everything that nobody had ever known at all about um, Margaret's youth. And, of course, all these letters, except the ones at the very end, were, one were ones written when nobody had heard of her. So they're, and they're to her sister, so they're innocent of any exterior intention. They're just what I've been doing, uh, my, my, my work, my studies, my friends. Um, and they're very interesting and amusing letters. The first surprising thing about them... Well, sorry, I should explain. As I say, I got them. 
and I was so busy still editing that I only took a cursory glance at them, thinking, um, you know, I will get back to them when I leave. And then, when I really got them out, I was incredible. I mean, here's, here's tons of boyfriends. You know, nobody knew anything about any of this. Um, I, and in one case, one that's already been serialised in the Daily Telegraph, the first boyfriend, I do believe that literally nobody knew anything about it, even at the time, except for Muriel and uh, Margaret's parents. I've tried all her friends at Oxford. They never, they knew, some of them knew she had a boyfriend, but they didn't know who it was. Not one person was able to name him. And, um, uh, and so I started to sort of sift through all of this and from this construct this absolutely fascinating picture of this life, this early life. And, um, and then, of course, you're going to ask the, find out more based on this information. So, for example, the, the boy for the first boyfriend, uh, Tony Bray, um, I had to work out where he'd been at Oxford in order to trace him. And it's a complicated matter because during the war, I, could, I couldn't find him. And he seemed to be in Christchurch because she mentioned Christchurch in the thing. But um, Christchurch had no record of him. And then I somehow discovered that during the war, um, there, was a, there was a special six-month course for army cadets where you sort of condensed... Uh, general, I think it's called general studies, and so he wasn't a full undergraduate. And again, something to do with the war. He was put in Christchurch, but he was actually at Brasenose College. So then, aha! Finally, um, I got it. And once I once I got, well, sorry, I discovered that Brasenose was in Christchurch. If you see what I mean, that allowed me to go to Brasenose. Then I was able to. The archivist couldn't wasn't allowed to put me in touch with him, but she wrote to him, and he was still alive. And he, in fact, he is still alive. And uh, and then he agreed to interview and so on. And by the way, you can see him on television on uh, BBC Two on uh, Saturday night at nine. It's called Young Margaret. And he, this will be the only television interview he will ever give because the poor gentleman is not at all well now. So it, I hope you, you find that worth looking at. So gradually, this picture starts to emerge of the, the, uh, the private life. And I, I really feel a, it was a great, great breakthrough. And then um, other people, they hear that I'm doing it. Margaret's given her permission, uh, and so they want to help me. So, for example, um, the person who was most instrumental in, in the Conservative Party in getting her made leader of the party was a prominent backbencher, a famous escaper from Coldwell, called Airy Neve. And uh, it turned out that Airy Neve had kept a diary of all of this, which nobody had ever seen, and his uh, daughter let me read it and quote from it. And so this sort of process, and again, completely fascinating, because you see whether he, and what you see is actually how they, the, the Tories could not make up their mind. They longed to get rid of Ted Heath, who they felt had failed, but they couldn't make up their mind. So you see Erin Eve, who's fond of Margaret Thatcher, but thinks maybe she can't do it. So back and forth, back and forth. Even when she's declared her candidacy, he, it took him another seven weeks actually to support her. Everything went so much more slowly in those days. And um, he, he, the other person, incredibly, was a man called Edward Ducan, who's still alive, who was the chairman of the 1922 committee, and uh, I think would now be generally agreed to be perfectly unsuitable to be the Conservative leader. But he, he, um, it was a serious chance of this happening. And you can see it all set out in Aries' diary um, in, in, in a very truthful way, because he's just writing for himself. He wasn't writing for uh, some ulterior motive. And then... Um, of course, when you get to the government paper and her own papers about the governmental period, there's a tremendous, um, overwhelming amount of detail. Her method in government was not to write memos herself. She would um, uh, uh, write on everybody else's memos. And um, so you see the process is this, that the way the files work is it's simply everything that cut across the Prime Minister's desk every day uh, divided into subjects. And sometimes, of course, they, it might be more than one subject at the same time. So let's say relations with the President of the United States might also be um, nuclear disarmament. So, so you would be in the nuclear, they'd both be in the nuclear file and in the US relations file or something like that. All, everything, so memos, letters, uh, responses from the private secretary. Obviously, some things, I think, throughout the history of British government get destroyed for reasons of embarrassment. Um, I think they get destroyed more now than they used to because of the perverse effect of the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, and um, 
uh, and some things are just muddled up or missing. But essentially, it's a very full uh, account of things. And um, she would write on them, and she would say, so you can see what she's thinking all the time, and she sort of says, feeble nonsense, or something like that. And then um, the, pr the private secretary's job is to turn that into a memo that goes back to the um, person who sent it. So he will say, the prime minister was not satisfied by the, you know, that's a, um, uh, uh, there's a sort of some level of interpretation, but not toting it down all that much. Um, and also, there are very, very big other sources. I mean, we're the first people, I say we, because I have a wonderful director of, I did all the primary research in Britain, but I have a wonderful director of research in the United States who has pretty well full time um, uh, gone through the, what are called the presidential libraries, which are the archives of each president and the archives of the State Department and so on. And um, absolutely marvelous discoveries. I mean, there's just an enormous mass of untouched material in all of these about all sorts of things, about the Falklands War, about uh, disarmament, uh, about Gorbachev, about um, the American invasion of Grenada. I mean, fantastic, fantastic stuff. And so there's all of this, I mean, and I, just to give you a sense of the scale of it, if I read every paper in the Churchill archives alone, um, I, I wouldn't be able to read it if I read nothing else and I lived to be 100. I mean, it's col completely colossal. So you have to be guided to some extent by the archivists. You have to know to some extent what you're looking for. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a serious, it's a serious problem. And also is the question of the witnesses. You must talk to the people who knew her and saw her. And one of the interesting things about oral witness is that people's memory is always, even people with a very good memory, stupendously inaccurate. Um, people, if you think about it yourself, if you try to remember a series of meetings that you'd attended 30 years ago, how could you? I mean, you would have some, something of them in your head, but the sequence, who said what, um, impossible. And by the way, civil servants are much better at remembering this than politicians because politicians are always rushing forward and they tend to put themselves the center of it and they're not trained to sort of take the note and pay attention to what everybody says, whereas the civil servant, that is his job. And so the civil servant is, a, is in, in that sense, a more accurate witness. But the inaccuracy of the oral testimony doesn't mean that it doesn't matter because what you get from that, which you never get or rarely get from the um, written record, is sort of things like who hates who or um, why politically was this happening at this time uh, or who was playing this game in order to win some battle. And so it's absolutely essential to have both of these sources and compare and contrast them. And then, of course, all the public sources, like what the media said at the time, what was said in Parliament, um, uh, television. Um, so, so it can sort of go on uh, forever, and you know, it jolly nearly did. Um, uh, and I'd never, I've never written a book before. I've written many millions of words of journalism. But of course, it's completely different writing journalism. Um, because you, it, as, as this, in the trade, you say the paper goes to bed, and uh, you, go, you, the author, go to bed, and you start again, and you. Whereas this is a work of enormous construction, and therefore very um, difficult, I found. And there's a fundamental problem about writing the biography of a prime minister, which is that sometimes you have to pick, focus on one subject because it's so intense, like let's say the Irish hunger strikes or the Falklands War or something like that, or the problem with the economy in 1981. But you have to remember that in the Prime Minister's day, she might literally have an assassination attempt, um, a run on the pound, uh, a reshuffle, um, uh, you know, and um, foot and mouth disease all happening on the same day. That would be, a, I mean, that would be a very characteristic thing about prime ministerial life, and it, all of them are something which she would have to pay attention to. So one has to try to convey this sense, and yet to think of a focus on some of the individual subjects. So there is no total solution to this problem, but I tend to move back and forth. I try to keep the narrative going of the overall kind, and sometimes break out to a chapter on, for example, as I say, the hunger strikes and the Falklands. But on the whole, the chronology matters very much. You want to get the move of it. You have to break off with each election as a sort of natural cesura. And um, you, you have to keep bear in mind always that you know, one thing leads to another. So you mustn't get too out of sync. And um, I just 
I think I'll give you a little flavour, if you like, of some of these primary sources because um, uh, it does bring it, this does bring um, history so much more alive than generalisation. Um, first of all, since it is chronologically first, uh, I just want you to read. I just want to read you um, when she meets a man who's very keen on her. Um, she was working in um, at BX Plastics in Manningtree. Um, and she was in, this in uh, Essex, and she was involved in Colchester Conservative. She was 22, I think. And she meets this chap at a conservative social function, and he comes rushing round to her office and invites her out. And, um, and he phoned and so on. And this is her writing to her sister about him. Uh, she's ref she refers to him as Scotty, because um, he was uh, Scottish. Um, <laughs> Eventually I said yes, and we dined at the George. He's about 35 and has a kind of naivety that only Scotsmen can have. <laughs> um, I expected to be bored to tears, but in fact he was really rather sweet with quite a sense of humour. He practically presented his credentials to me. His farm is worth £25,000, which is actually a hell of a lot of money. Then. He has 3,000 one-pound shares of ICI, now standing at 47 shillings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A, a thousand of something else, 500 of this and that and so on and so forth. And he paid surtax last year. Surtax was the top rate of tax. And being a Scotsman, he left a ninepenny tip for the waiter. <laughs> I could have fallen through the floor. That's how people with money keep it. <laughs> He's had a new Rover on order for three years. So that shows, of course, how the lack of supply in those days. You couldn't just go out and buy a car. He had to wait, have it on order. He bought a refrigerator a few months ago. That was also very posh at the time. Um, he's having two new sheds built at a cost of £900, all this over dinner. Uh, and then she says, um, he drove me home in his present rather old car and got quite ardent on the way. I said I couldn't possibly fix another definite date, so he's going to phone me. The funniest part is that although I've been introduced to him twice, I can never catch his name and still don't know him. <laughs> um, uh, his, his people are farmers. He speaks with a frightfully Scotch accent. I'm afraid he's going to be an awful nuisance, but I'd rather like to see his farm as a matter of curiosity. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and so it goes on. And what happened was that um, uh, she very much liked Scotty, but she realised, Willie was his real name, Willie, Willie Cullen, that he did want to marry her and she didn't want to marry him because she didn't want to be a farmer's wife. And, um, and this is actually rather sort of, I think, interesting about her... Um, sense of her, you, the sense you get of her underlying ambitions and of what she knew she really wanted to do, even if she perhaps couldn't quite put it in words. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Yes. She goes to dinner at Fulton Hall, which is his farm, um, and where his sister kept house, and they had dinner, and then um, she wrote this. A quote, the wives were typical wives. They know of domestic matters and nothing else. I stayed with the men after supper talking about many other things because in those days, of course, the women would leave after supper um, uh, and the men would go on talking at table and the women would go to another room. And, of course, it's Margaret's not leaving. She's staying with the men. I stayed with the men after supper talking about many other things and when William suggested that maybe we ought to join the ladies, David, who was a, a local farmer, said in a rather contemptuous fashion, why, they don't talk politics or anything else in there. And that's how they regard their wives. And indeed, when we did join the ladies for half an hour or so, much later, conversation flagged entirely. So she's suddenly getting a vista of a life which, while she perfectly respects it, she knows couldn't be her life. And so what she did <laughs> was to um, palm Willie off on her sister. And um, uh, Willie married her sister. And, um, and Margaret was the bridesmaid. And um, it's just, it's just marvellous. It's just too good to be true. And, um, and they lived happily ever after, Margaret and Willie, and uh, um, not my, uh, um, uh, Muriel and Willie, and um, uh, he died in the late 90s. But as his son said, he did always have a soft spot for Auntie Margaret. <laughs> um, and then um, a, a source from much later on, which I just want to do this because this is an external source, and this just shows the sort of a moment of crisis. In 1981, the worst year for her, really, when it seemed that all the economic problems were going wrong and that her policies weren't working and that her colleagues were trying to throw her out, um, John Hoskins was the head of her policy unit and therefore, by definition, loyal to her. Um, 
but he was very worried because he thought she didn't have enough strategy and he was worried by the way she did things. And he sent her this extraordinary memo, memo which he called the blockbuster. Um, and it, it, says, it has headlines that say things like, you lack management competence and your own leadership style is wrong. And then he said, you break every rule of good man management. You bully your weaker colleagues. You criticize colleagues in front of each other and in front of their officials. They can't answer back without appearing disrespectful in, in front of others to, to a woman and to a prime minister. You abuse that situation. You give little praise or credit, and you are too ready to blame others when things go wrong. The result is an unhappy ship. This demoralization is hidden only from you. People are beginning to feel that everything is a waste of time. Another government is on its way to the footnotes of history. And people are starting to speculate as to who might reunite the party, as Macmillan did after series, if you go. But no one tells you what is happening, just as no one told Ted. To survive, you have an absolute duty to change the way you operate. So he wasn't pulling his punches. And actually, I think it speaks well. This is a surprising feature of Mrs. Thatcher, that um, she was, particularly in those early days, remarkably ready to listen to this sort of thing. I mean, this did, did make her very angry. She did say she sort of hissed at him. That's the rudest letter anyone's ever received from prime, any prime minister ever received. But um, uh, you cannot imagine anyone in Gordon Brown's entourage writing such a letter and surviving for <laughs> um, 15 minutes. And there was a, because she was so interested in actually getting the task achieved, she was ready to listen. As long as she thought the person was fundamentally on her side, she, she was prepared to listen to those criticisms. And some of them actually did have a good effect. Um, and then two things from the Falklands War. Um, one, one is, again, we, we found this. This is a, an American official who, when the Falklands War broke out, there was a, into, um, a sort of mediation attempt by the US government who wanted to avoid conflict. And uh, the US Secretary of State, Al Haig, some of you, the older people here, will remember this happening. He did a shuttle back and forth um, from Argentina to Washington to Britain, trying to see if some, something could be in some way uh, negotiated. And one of his officials was this chap, Jim Wrenchel, and he kept a diary of it all, which he showed me, and he hadn't, uh, uh, nobody else has seen it before. And here they are, they've been charging around trying to sort this matter out, and emotions are running very high. And um, Al Haig came to dinner in number 10 Downing Street, and so did Wrenchler with, with Mrs. Thatcher. And he describes the scene at dinner. High colour is in her cheeks, a note of rising, in, rising indignation in her voice. She leans across the polished table and flatly rejects what she calls the willingness of our second stage formulation, conceived in our view as, as a traditional face-saving ploy for Galtieri. Galtieri, of course, was the Argentine president. Um, and then he quotes her, I am pledged to restore British administration. I did not dispatch a fleet to install some nebulous arrangement which would have no authority whatsoever. Interim authority. To do what? I beg you, I beg you to remember that in 1938, Neville Chamberlain sat at the same table discussing an arrangement which sounds very like the one you were asking me to accept. <laughs> and were I to do so, I would be censured in the House of Commons, and properly so. We in Britain simply refuse to reward aggression. That is the lesson we've learned from 1938. So you can, you get a very, you know, you can feel you're there. And um, in one of the, I mean, the Falklands is a very, very extraordinary story, and everyone knows that. But one of the, again, one of the things I've seen that we hasn't been seen before is the account that she herself wrote of it the year after. She used, she drew on that account in her own memoirs, but this actual, the full account has never been seen. And this is unique that she wrote a long account of anything, because she, she tended not to do that, uh, partly just of being too busy. And again, this point I made earlier of not looking back, but Falklands had such a deep effect on her that um, she did want to record some of it. And at Easter 1983, so a year after the, the problem began, and about, um, therefore, 10 months after she, what had, what the British had won, um, she wrote an account. And this is what she... She writes about the very end of it, when the news came through. <clears throat> um, and the Argentines surrendered. Um, and uh, yes, General Moore, who was the commander of land forces there, sent the message 
signal by signal, Major General Menendez surrendered to me all the Argentine armed forces in East and West Falkland, together with their impedimenta. The Falkland Islands are once more under the government desired by their inhabitants. God save the Queen. And um, then there's a question of how can she tell the House of Commons? Unlike more recent Prime Ministers, she was very punctilious about telling the House of Commons first, which is what you, you should do in most situations. And she didn't want to just go out on the media. But there was no procedural way late at night when the news came through of telling the House of Commons. So a sort of rather bogus procedural device of a sort of answer to a question uh, was invented, was especially invented. No, a point of order. I'm sorry, it was a point of order that was somehow invented. And um, she came to the chamber at 10.14. And she said, after successful attacks last night, General Moore decided to press forward. The Argentines retreated. Our forces reached the outskirts of Port Stanley. Large numbers of Argentine soldiers threw down their weapons. They reported to be flying white flags over Port Stanley. And then she explained what had happened. And after everyone cheered, and then she went up to um, her room in the Commons afterwards. And Willie Whitelaw, her deputy, proposed a toast. He said, I don't think anyone else but you could have done it. And Anthony Ackland, the head of the Foreign Office, who was there, as to, um, remembered that she started weeping out of relief. And Dennis put his arm around her and said, well done, have a drink. And, um, and uh, <laughs> she, um, uh, she then um, uh, wrote about it. She went home, and um, the crowds were all singing Rule Britannia. In those days, b before IRA attacks, um, the crowds were allowed into Downing Street. And so they were all milling around Downing Street singing Rule Britannia. And this is what she wrote about that. Downing Street was full of, young, of people, young people. It was their generation who'd done it. Today's heroes, Britain still breeds them. As I went to sleep very late that night, I felt an enormous burden had been lifted from my shoulders, and future worries would be small compared with those of life or death, which had been with us constantly for 11 weeks. It was a miracle wrought by ordinary men and women with extra extraordinary qualities, forever bold, forever brave, forever remembered. So there's a sort of sample of um, the original material that, uh, that I've been able to look at. And I've tried to put this into what I hope will be uh, an interesting story. Thanks very much. Let's have some questions. OK, um, I have a number of questions, but uh, we're, time is limited. So let me, uh, in the normal way, uh, uh, whichever you're most comfortable with. Um, okay, I'll stay. Oh, you stay there. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you want, in the, up there too. Right, we'll take two here together and then the gentleman behind. So one, two, three. Yes. Charles, how far would you consider uh, the period of history in which Lady Thatcher uh, was Prime Minister... Uh, to mark, go with, flow with the warp and woof of British history? And how far would you consider it an exceptional period? Um, perhaps given that the left was then divided uh, over both strategic and economic questions, and now it tends to be more united on those same questions. How far is this, would, are we talking about an exceptional period here, and how far that uh, one that, walks, uh, that goes more with the yes. general rule? OK, we'll take the three together. Take, together, yeah. take the three together, yeah. more efficient. Yeah. I've read most of your book over last weekend and Goodness. thoroughly recommend it. Thank you. <laughs> One thing puzz puzzled me. Um, Mrs Thatcher greatly admired three contemporary politicians. Lord Marshall, who when he was, uh, lost the job at Maplin, set up the world's largest coach tour operator, Wallace Arnold. Lord Belwyn, who as her junior minister saw through the Lord's 37 Acts of Parliament, beating by three the previous record of William Pitt. And John Gunnell, the Labour member for one of the South Yorkshire constituencies, who set up the United Nations International School in New York, um, regarded by many as the finest secondary school in the world. None of these three musketeers appears in your book or in any other of the books about Mrs. Thatcher's life. And I wondered if there was some explanation for that which escapes me. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, okay. we'll take, take the third. The third yeah. and then we'll, yeah. Uh, uh, Charles Moore, I am a civil servant, so I do <laughs> sympathise with how you feel. Um, I'd like to um, 
bring you to the, the, the devices sniff of Margaret Thatcher, and I saw question time, um, how, you, how you were dealing with that, and, and, and in your exchanges with Mr. Blunkett. Um, do you think, does the book say that her, in her, rather her, not how you approach things in her personality, but rather in her historical context, you know, she did have a lot of fights to, 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 to fight, the, the miners, the Republican movement, etc., etc. Does the book bring that out? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, to take the, the particular question, um, uh, the two of the people you mentioned, Marshall and Belwin, I would hope to be able to say something about in the second volume. Um, the other gentleman I'm very ashamed to say I haven't even heard of, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, uh, and, but it's interesting, Mr. Labour MP, because though Mr. Satchel, nobody could be more fiercely partisan, but really much too partisan often, uh, than Mrs. Thatcher. Um, she did respect some Labour MPs, and there was a strand in the Labour Party which she particularly liked, and she, used, she had a quite simple phrase. She said, what's good about the Labour Party is that it stands up for the underdog, and whenever she met an MP, a Labour MP, who she thought genuinely stood up for the underdog, she liked that. What she didn't like was doctrinaire, socialism, Marxism, um, uh, you know, and uh, the hard left, or the type of snooty Labour MP who actually doesn't like the workers. And, um, uh, but... Um, she, she liked to sort of, for example, she liked Eric Heffer, though he was very left wing, um, and she liked um, uh, Welsh mining and people, Jim Griffith, a, a, a chap called Charlie Pannell, who was a member for Dartford. Um, it was a strand. On the, there are sort of, perhaps I can try to bring together the other two questions. Um, it was an exceptional period because um, Margaret Thatcher would only become leader of the Conservative Party and only have become Prime Minister because things were very difficult. Nobody would ever have chosen her in peaceful, easy times. Um, it's because they needed a, a different type of analysis and that everything seemed to have gone wrong that they sought such an unusual person. And uh, we then had a period of um, prosperity that turned out to be rather frittered in the 90s and the, and the early part of this century. And what I think now is that we're in a situation where the sort of leadership style that Margaret Thatcher had and the approach is something that people want more than they did a few years ago. I don't think that they want another Thatcher. Obviously, the, gen the whole everything's different for the generation, but nevertheless, there's a question, uh, there's a crisis. There's a feeling of what is Western capitalism? What is Western civilization? How do we ensure prosperity and fairness? Um, uh, are, is the whole of the West being overtaken by exterior forces? And so on, which we've really had since 2008. And I think everybody, it's not a it's a, a point that stretches right across the Western world, is that the leaders of the Western world at this time seem to me like the leaders of the Western world in about 1975, that they know there are problems, but they don't really want to talk about them, and they don't really know how to lead through them. And you can see their wish in someone like Obama or David Cameron. It's called Tina. Hmm? Tina. Yes, there is no alternative, yeah. And, um, well, yes, um, uh, but I think Angela Merkel is doing something very interesting, but I don't think she's analysing at least not in public discourse, the depth of the problem. In, in the city, they say Let's, you should kitchen sink a problem, is the phrase they use. You should put everything in, chuck it in the kitchen sink, and look at it and clean it up. And Mrs. Thatcher was trying to do that. And I think people want something like that today. Not necessarily in the same character, as I say, but, but they do. there is some search for some such reanalysis. Re I don't know whether it will be a left-wing person or a right-wing person that will come up with it, but it will happen. And then we'll start to see change, and we haven't had that yet. Um, on your point about divisiveness, I think it's unquestionably the case that Margaret Thatcher was divisive as a character. Let's say um, she liked to have a fight, um, and by temperament, and she thought division produced, in the sense of argument, produced a better understanding of things. I mean, for example, you know, when it's in the House of Commons, when they vote, it's called a division. They split. Um, it's not called a consensus. They don't, so you don't have a bell ringing in the House of Commons. Now it's a consensus bell. It's a division bell. And um, you, you, must set out, you must set up your, what you think and test it against the people who disagree with you. And sometimes she, she took that, there was a sort of antagonism there, which she almost uh, courted. However, when it's been said endlessly on the BBC that um, she... Um, left a divisive legacy. I'm not completely sure that in terms of what actually happened, this is really the case. 
I mean, the classic example for me, there are two classic examples for me about this. One is the whole situation at the workplace and the whole uh, of how, what, hap what happens at the workplace, the industrial scene. This generation hardly ever suffers from strikes. It, it, it was absolute, when I was as of the age that many of the students here today are, um, strikes were absolutely perennial, which is, this was in the late 70s, absolutely constant presence in one's life, turning the lights off, meaning you couldn't get paper or uh, you couldn't get a train. Or, um, and in 1979, when she came into office, there were 29 million working days lost to strikes. And when she left office in 1990, there were fewer than 2 million working days lost to strikes. So actually, however angry people felt about some of the things that had happened, there was peace in people's lives to a degree in, the, in their working lives in, in a way that was, had been totally unknown in the 1970s. So I don't think that's a divisive legacy. And the other one like that is the Cold War. When she became um, uh, leader, she, uh, leader, she made a famously controversial speech which got her called the Iron Lady when she said that the whole idea of detente and closer relations with the Soviet Union was a con because the Soviet Union was not actually a genuine partner for peace, but was increasing its um, uh, nuclear arsenal and um, also its infiltration of the West and its attempts to subvert Western democracy. And she reached out, she was the first Western political leader to see this not only in um, interstate terms, but in terms of the people who lived in those countries. So she would say how important it was, what's happening to the people of the Soviet Union or the people of Poland? How are they living? Are they free? Um, you know, are their rights being protected? So she would read it, which was in very inflammatory for the Soviet government, uh, but a real clarion call to them. And one of the things that's been fascinating to me in this period of her death is the overwhelming enthusiasm for her in the former Eastern Europe. I mean, all the, it's, it's absolutely huge. She's a complete heroine. And it, it wasn't very widely reported at the time, but you know, in those late years of just before the fall of the Berlin Wall, when she went to Poland and Russia and places like that, literally hundreds of thousands of people came on, out on the street to cheer her. And um, there was a famous thing when they, because Gorbachev was opening up in 1987, um, she, um, he allowed her to be interviewed on Soviet television. Of course, they'd never seen anything like the Soviet television was totally controlled. And they had two sort of great big fat thuggish interviewers who were the um, uh, sort of the interviewers from the Kremlin type, you know, obviously. And they tried to sort of bully her. And they had sort of tricks up their sleeve, which they sort of, but of course, because she was much more used to interviews, she could easily conquer this. And, um, and they were completely sort of trounced. And the Soviet, must be the only time in human history that the public rang up to ask for an interview for politicians to go on longer. And people started <laughs> ringing um, the, the Soviet news station, saying, please, we want to you know, go on. And um, so I think with the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, the whole Gorbachev process and the, it was not a, of course, it was a very problematic legacy, but when you think that it could have produced uh, revolution or repression, uh, you know, Soviet repression nearly did happen. I mean, they tried to overthrow Gorbachev and so on. She had a lot to do with that. She was the first person in the West to notice Gorbachev. Uh, having built up our nuclear response, she was able to feel in a strong position to start negotiating. So I think in that too, she left a more peaceful legacy. She didn't. She left a world in which she played a very significant part, where it wasn't divided between two absolutely ideologically opposing groups. So divisive in some ways, but in some very important ways not. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's uh, question here, and then one there, and then one at the back there. Yeah. There wants to ask where the answer. Okay. Thank you. A uh, couple of points for May. First of all, um, Margaret Thatcher presided over the removal of all grammar schools when she was Education Secretary, when either Anthony Crossland before her or Shirley Williams after her. And I just wondered, did she in any way regret that? Uh, because until, that is, you may have something to say in your second volume, until Kenneth Baker was Education Secretary, very little progress on that. But this, my second point is this. Would Margaret Thatcher have won, or would the Conservatives have won a second term in 1983 without the Falklands, bearing in mind, that is, that the opposition was in a fair state of chaos? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And 
In your biography, you stress uh, Margaret Thatcher's religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, a criticism made by John Gray, who used to teach here, mm -hmm. is that um, in many ways her kind of free market values undermined the social conservative beliefs that she had. Do you see any, and I suppose the moment when this came into play was over Sunday trading, where she went against her mentist upbringing, but do you see a, a contradiction here between her religious views and the, the effects of the market? And gentlemen at the back. Uh, <coughs> uh, Mr. Law, I haven't unfortunately had the opportunity of reading your book, but from the publicity, uh, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies attributed to Mrs. Thatcher. And when considering my own family, which came from the same part of South Lincolnshire as she did, I saw these uh, qualities mirrored in them. Uh, I wonder how much uh, Margaret Thatcher was very much. Uh, a, a product, if I could, like that of her birth and her early upbringing in that particular part of the country. Mm. Well, on that last point first, um, I have a slight theory about the British Isles, which is there's a very strong characteristics of the East are very different from those of the West. And um, to put it in very crude caricature terms, the people of the East are rather um, sort of quite fierce, reserved and hardworking. Uh, and puritanical, and the ones of the, of the West are much more drunk, wild, romantic. Um, <laughs> this isn't completely true because Geordies might well come into the West. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I think certainly that sort of non-conformist background, which is very strong in that part of, of England, um, you're, you're essentially right about that. And one of the things that is very interesting to me about Margaret Thatcher is how she represents a lot of ordinary, popular qualities and culture and yet was also so extraordinary. So there's a funny mixture in which there's always Grantham in the girl, and yet there's, there's something global as well. Um, the, uh, on the grammar schools, you're absolutely right that Mrs. Thatcher presided, she didn't actually, it's not technically right to say she abolished the grammar schools, but she presided over the abolition of grammar schools more than anyone else. And the reason for that, well, it's quite complicated, I do explain this in the book, but the essential reason is that the Secretary of State for Education those days did not have the power. It was a, it, it was an unpowerful job, which in some ways is not a bad thing, actually. And um, the, um, the local councils were the ones who had the capacity to um, change their schools. And they, once they were allowed to comprehensivize, most of them did want to, including a lot of Tory ones. And all that Mrs. Thatcher was able to do to prevent this was to withdraw the central government circulars, as they were called, which, um, uh, which Anthony Crossland had put out. Um, which sort of tried to make councils go comprehensive. So she upheld councils who didn't want to go comprehensive, but she wasn't able to stop the whole process, she, and she, she much regretted that, but that's, that's why it happened. You also asked about um, would she have won the 83 election without the Falklands War. I don't really like answering counterfactual questions because I don't see how one can. But the only thing I would say, I mean, obviously the Falklands gave her a huge boost, but. The opposition was divided and ill and ill led in the case of Michael Foote, and it's also true that the economic situation was already recovering just before the Falklands War, having been desperate in 1980-81. The what were later called the green shoots of recovery were were already being noticed. So, uh, who can say? But you see the the context. The very interesting point about religion and did her um, free market values conflict with um, with her religious beliefs and her idea of sort of social coherence. Um, the cruelest way that this was put it is Peregrine Wurzel once said that Mrs. Thatcher tried to create a society in the image of her father and ended up creating one in the image of her son. This is unfair, but I can see why um, uh, part of it because it's well, it's, it is unfair, but, um, but I can see that a, there was definitely a tension here. Um, she wanted to liberalise an economy that had been incredibly over-restricted, and this made the country poorer than it needed to be, and it restricted opportunity. So it was a very strong and a very moral reason for doing that. On the other hand, um, if you... And, and in fact, markets are, in her doctrine, a, a social good. 
they, they enable people to communicate truthfully with one another in a way that's essentially cooperative. So she had no problem with that at that level. But of course, if you, um, you have to think about the precise effects in how you do it. Um, and if you also encourage too much of a consumer boom by what you do with interest rates, um, you will tend, the people who have this greater freedom will tend not to, not to save and invest, but to borrow and spend. And um, this was a problem in the later period. Um, I think, to be fair, this is actually more a problem encouraged by Nigel Lawson than by her. Um, she was, didn't really want this, but nevertheless, she handled it poorly. And um, there, there, was, it, it, there was a serious problem there, and Sunday trading was an example of that. I mean, she had to abolish Sunday trading. You couldn't have, there was extraordinary, the laws that forbid, forbade Sunday trading were extraordinary. So for example, due to a complication that I won't bother to expand, it was illegal to sell Bibles on a Sunday, but legal to sell pornography. Um, <laughs> and it really was a very odd set of laws. But the, um, and you know, in the end, if people want to trade on Sunday, you can't, in modern times, you can't tell them they can't. Uh, it, it, it had to change, but nevertheless, the sort of certain type of peacefulness that used to prevail in British society was diminished by, by all of this. And the only other thing I'd say on this is that um, what really isn't true is this idea that she didn't care about society. I can well understand the argument that in some way she damaged society, but it's absolutely not true to say that she didn't believe it or she didn't care about it. She thought about it tremendously, and anyone who reads the famous No Such Thing as Society interview will see what she was actually talking about. If she was a more modern person, what she would have said is there's no such thing as society. Um, she was trying to explain what composed society rather than opposing it. And actually, that was very well expressed in the, by the Bishop of London in his uh, sermon at the funeral. Now, we're in your hands here because you need to. I mean, can we take a couple more questions? And then yes, could it just two, please? Two, okay. Well, let's give the balcony a chance. There's a chap over the hand and a woman in the front. Please do. Hand there. Hand there. Hand there. Um, um, Charles. Uh, you mentioned the, I, the, her support for the underdog. Uh, a few weeks ago in the Times, Tim Montgomery wrote that the reason for her fight against the unions was because they held excessive power and that now she would greatly support campaigning against large corporations to pay taxes. Would you agree with that? Thank you. And on the front row here. Yeah. Again, short and sharp again. What, what do you think about Margaret Thatcher bombing the vessel that was clearly retreating from the Falklands? And do you think, because she was a woman, she thought that she had to be tougher than her male counterparts, because she was the only, one of the only women in Parliament? And do you think that attributed to her decision about bombing the vessel, the, the Venezuelan vessel? Argentina. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. The, the Belgrana, of course. The, the, the Belgrana you're talking about, yes. Um, on, on, the, on the general woman question first, um, uh, she did undoubtedly feel that she had to be tougher, work harder, do everything better and more than the men because she knew that she didn't have a sort of clubby support. She knew that if she didn't succeed, she would fail. Her, her, her failure would be total. Um, they, would, they would chuck her out. So she had to do everything sort of much harder and much more sort of full on, as we now say, than, uh, than a man would have had to, to do. But in the case of Del Belgrano, this, this is not a relevant consideration, and that's not why it happened. Um, what happened was that uh, the, Argent the, the greatest British fear was that our aircraft carriers would be, we had two carriers, and that's all. And if, if even one of them had gone, we would not have probably been able to win. And if two of them had gone, we certainly wouldn't have been able to win. And the Vanti Cinco de Mayo, which is the um, uh, Argentine aircraft carrier, was trying to come closer so that uh, its aircraft could attack our ships. And it was uh, 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 supported by uh, cruisers and destroyers. Belgrano was a cruiser. And um, uh, they the were capable of firing exocets. Captain uh, uh, Admiral Woodward, who was the admiral in charge in the, in the, in the zone, um, believed that, that the um, Belgrano was a threat. And he exceeded his orders deliberately in order to get an answer out of London. Or, or, uh, Northwood is actually the headquarters. Um, so he, so he gave orders 
that the Belgrano should be sunk, which he wasn't entitled to do, and he did it deliberately knowing that um, it, those orders would be countermanded. So he wasn't going to, it, it was trying to make the generals back at home concentrate. So they then concentrated, and they thought, um, what is going on here? And the, the point about the Belgrano sailing away is irrelevant, because this is a tactical question. Obviously, um, the Argentine admiral wanted to uh, you know, take avoiding action. And Britain had already um, uh, wanted to extend the exclusion zone, and it took legal advice on whether it could do this. And so the question seemed very clear. There was an emergency meeting at Chequers with the chiefs of staff and uh, the senior politicians, and of course Mrs. Thatcher. And there seemed to be no question in the view of the uh, chiefs of staff uh, that the military threat to the British task force was such that uh, the, it was reasonable to sink the Belgrano. There's no evidence that Mrs. Thatcher especially personally wanted this. She didn't take the lead on it, but she thought it was... Um, the, the right thing to do. And sometimes it's been said that it was deliberately done to stop the Peruvian peace plan that was coming forward. But actually this isn't the case. At the time they took this decision, they didn't know, they hadn't seen the Peruvian peace plan. So I, th I think it's a red herring. But I think your basic question is a very important one about how did she see life? How did she have, being all alone and the only woman? And here, the vital thing is she didn't, she, did, she wanted women to be able to get into the things that are always associated with men. And that's why she didn't really want to do education as a job, and she didn't want to do health and things like that, because they, they were sort of the, the ghetto bit for women, because the men wanted to keep the things that they considered really matter, which is money, uh, war, power, and diplomacy. And, um, and so her big aim was that she should get on the grip of those subjects. And then she would really have broken through and really given the men what for. The, uh, the other question about the, uh, the trade she, unions mm. is true. Would she have thought the, would she be today opposing companies that don't pay their tax and um, all of that? Mrs. Thatcher was very keen on loan taxes, but she was certainly not keen on people not paying their taxes. Um, and indeed, one of her arguments was that um, if you... Um, if, if you make taxes higher, people avoid them and evade them more. Um, I'll just end with this story, which is, because it's very characteristic of her. In 1997, when I got the um, commission, I was staying with friends, and she was there in the country. And our son came into the room after lunch, and he, um, he, he, he was seven at the time. And he suddenly asked Mrs. Thatcher a question. And I didn't know he thought he knew who she was, but he said, did you like being Prime Minister? And she said, well, we had to make important decisions and improve the life of our country. So yes, we liked it very much. <laughs> so he said, um, oh, well, did you pass some good laws then? And she said, yes, we did. We made Britain strong in defence, we reduced the power of the trade unions, and we cut taxes. And if people can keep more of what they earn, they earn more. And um, Unfortunately, he then said, oh, so did you get very rich when you were prime minister? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she, um, no, we did not. In fact, we forewent some of our income. But uh, uh, I, 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 I thought this was a very interesting and characteristic exchange because, first of all, she treated him like a grown-up. She was fierce but not rude. She treated, took his questions seriously. And secondly, in an incredible sort of directness, she got the key messages across. I mean, she's the ultimate sort of advertising woman in a way. Here are the three points. You know, you've only got 15 seconds before the boy goes off to play football or something. And boom, boom. Thank you. I'm afraid I must stop there. Okay. my opportunity to ask the question of whether Mrs Thatcher left a legacy of making the Conservative Party traditionally not ideological into a more ideological party with an awkward fringe which makes David Cameron's job difficult today. But we'll leave that for another time. Um, I'd like to thank Charles Moore for his, uh, not only uh, telling us more about a figure we all feel we know and understand and either in some cases like and in some cases definitely don't like, but we now know more. But more than that, and I think particularly important in a university, 
more about the process, the detective work, the hard slog that libraries full of papers and all of that part of actually putting together a biography, which I think is absolutely fascinating, methodologically very important for us all. So thank you very much, Charles. Thank you for coming this evening. And, oh, audience, there's now an opportunity for anybody who wishes to, to buy a copy of the book, have it signed if you've got one already, and so on. So thank you all very much, and I hope to see you again here soon. Thank you.